Hi, I'm Taxon Fernandez, and I'll be taking you through the topic of low back pain. As we go through um, today's talk, we shall look at the global impact of pain, uh, some of the risk factors and risk flags, look at the anatomical considerations, clinical evaluation, investigative techniques, management strategies, and evaluation of outcomes and how they have a role or an impact on management of patients. When we look at the impact that low back pain has on all of us, it, it, it almost appears to be quite significant. Um, almost one third of the patients in the UK have low back pain and present to their GPs in Australia. The costs are beyond a billion Australian dollars. So in the United States, it accounts for a third to a fourth of the total cost of care. The lifetime prevalence of pain, an episode of low back pain, can be anywhere between 11 to 84 percent. And disability seems to account for a significant amount of economic disruption or cost. So when we look at a low back pain in relation to absence from work, a study in 1999 showed that it accounted for 40 percent of the absences from work. And as you see in this um, pie chart. It's second only to common cold. So what are the risk factors that um, predispose one to develop low back pain? There may be causes that are biomechanical, psychosocial, or personal causes that are contributory to developing low back pain. However, there have been a few authors who more recently have contested the relationship between physical exertion or physical activity and development of low back pain. So bear that in mind. Uh, but going back into this classification of biomechanical causes can be heavy lifting, strength related workouts, frequency of heavy activity, driving, long hours of driving, and heavy machinery use of the use of those can contribute to it. Psychosocial uh, factors such as stress, anxiety, and depression have a significant role. Personal factors such as um, mm. predisposed anatom an anatomical changes uh, may have a significant role. Genetics, we know that some of the patients who have uh, congenital insensitivity to pain, such as those with the SCN9A gene, would have a lot lesser pain than others who would be highly predisposed to developing chronic pain. Obesity, personality-related factors, litigation, and other structural changes may contribute to low back pain. When we talk about the classification of low back pain, um, how do we describe it? Well, the commonest classification puts it across as acute and chronic, and that would be less than three months being acute pain and beyond that being chronic pain. Sometimes we use subacute as an included criteria into classification of pain. And subacute is, um, is only when we use the acute pain as being less than six weeks, subacute being six weeks to three months, and chronic being beyond three months. If you try to classify pain on the anatomical basis, um, we would then look at the International Association for Study of Pain's uh, classification, which is on a topographical basis of classification. And what they tend to do is to use the lowest thoracic uh, spinous process and a transverse line drawn across that, another transverse line going across the sacrococcygeal line, and two horizontal lines going across the lateral border of the erector spinae, which then forms the anatomical limitations of uh, the low back area. What are the anatomical considerations that we should bear in mind when we talk about low back pain? Well, I think the most important thing is to understand what is a structural functional unit. And a single functional motion unit would be two vertebrae with an intervertebral disc in between it and the nerves supplying the area. If you look at this uh, cartoon which shows you what a functional motion segment comprises, we then go into the several different components of it and the articulatory structures are predominantly from the zygopophyseal joints, uh, ligaments and muscles, um, the hyaline cartilage that forms the crisscross matrix, and the collagenous rings of the annulus fibrosus, the adjacent vertebral bodies, and the nucleus pulposus within the annulus fibrosus. Looking at the annulus fibrosus, 
They are concentric rings of collagen, and predominantly type 1 collagen uh, comprises 80% of it. The outer rings are 10 to 25 lamellar rings, and it forms quite a composite, tough structure, which protects the inner nucleus pulposus, which is not as mechanically stable as the annulus fibrosus. However, the nucleus pulposus has a high concentration of proteoglycans, almost 27 times more than that found in collagen. And not surprisingly, it only contains 20% of collagen, predominantly type 2. There are several different types of proteoglycans in the nucleus pulposus, to mention a few, agrican, veriscan, decorin, and fibromodulin. We now look at the innovation of this functional unit. And there are several branches that come across from the nerve root, the medial branch of the dorsal ramus, the lateral branch of the dorsal ramus, gray rami communicantes, and sinovertebral nerves. The medial branch of the dorsal ramus innovates the facet joint, ligaments, the vertebral arch, spinous processes, and the paraspinal muscles. The lateral branch of the dorsal ramus innovates predominantly the paraspinal muscles. Gray rami communicants uh, supply the anterior and lateral aspects of the intervertebral disc and the anterior longitudinal ligament. The sinovertebral nerve innovates the posterior components, i.e. the posterior longitudinal ligament, dura, and the posterior aspect of the intervertebral disc. Got a little cartoon again which shows you the innovation of these structures. When we do a medial branch block, which we shall discuss later in management of low back pain, we aim to, to block the medial branch as a diagnostic text towards determining if it is the source of low back pain, and this cartoon shows uh, just that. To recap the innovation of at each level, you have the nerve root which brings, which comes in and gives out the posterior branch which has the medial and lateral branches and the medial branch supplies the facet joint, the ligaments there, and the paraspinal muscles. The lateral branch supplies mainly the muscles. You then have the branches from the sympathetic chain, the gray rami communicants, which supply the anterior lateral aspects of the disc and the anterior longi longitudinal ligament. The sinovertebral nerve supplies the posterior aspects, i.e. the dura, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the posterior aspect of the intervertebral disc. We now move on to recognition of rare presentations in chronic pain patients. And I know that this flag system and risk factors have been discussed by Dr. Cristalis in another talk. Uh, however, I'd like to emphasize a few aspects here which are key during an evaluation of a patient presenting with low back pain. The red flags here is what we'd like to focus, and these are areas that need to be assessed and evaluated during a history and clinical examination to rule out specific factors that may be of urgent, that may need urgent attention. Now, uh, I've marked out a few here, and corda equina being one of them, it is a situation which I would call or classify into categories, and category one would be where you need urgent or immediate attention. For example, if you did an epidural on a patient and they present to you a couple of uh, days later with severe low back pain presenting with an acute cord equina, it would be imperative to have this patient urgently or immediately investigated and go on to have surgery. Now, category two would be someone who has a condition which does not require immediate attention but requires to be noted, evaluated, and followed up you know, fairly quickly. An example of that would be someone who comes in with a fracture or, for example, someone who comes in with an infection which is, which is lingering but needs a fairly urgent investigation and action thereafter. Category three, on the other hand, would be someone who has a pre-existing condition and needs serial follow-ups to ensure that they do not have a predisposing um, contribution towards their clinical presentation. For example, someone with an aortic aneurysm who is being monitored for low back and abdominal pain needs to be followed up with serial uh, evaluatory consultations. So it's important to bear in mind the other uh, flags as well, and we will come into that at another talk, uh, at another time. 
So how would you detect the non-organic causes of low back pain? Now, the non-organic causes of low back pain can be uh, of some importance in certain groups of patients. And in the 80s, uh, Waddell and his team brought out five different categories of signs that you would use to determine whether there are non-organic presentatory features in patients. And these would include tests on tenderness. Now you would press in several different areas and superficial um, evaluation would cause significant amount of discomfort. Simulation tests, and these could be tests which are meant to mimic certain, uh, certain evaluatory tests and would bring on pain. Distraction tests, so you do an SLR or you do a modified SLR after that and distract them while doing that and it still evokes pain. Regional disturbances, which are non-anatomical or non-dermatomal and still bring on pain in these patients. Overreaction. So these five categories were brought out by Wardell and they were quite significantly contributory in ruling out non-organic causes. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of Wardell signs? I think they're quick. They can be used as a screening tool and they determine if the patient needs further psychological evaluation or assessment. Disadvantages. Every, every, every test has its own disadvantages. With Wardle signs, I think you have to learn not to be biased with it. It can take a little time, and we need to understand that it can be misinterpreted or misused. It's not one to be used to decide whether surgery is an option or to rule out a, an underlying psychiatric problem. It may also not be useful to rule out secondary gain or malingering. So it does not actually predispose to determining whether one is uh, has a contraindication to surgery or not. Bearing in mind the organic and non-organic causes of um, pain, it is important to understand where the organic pathology may lie when someone presents to you with low back pain. And this may be from the muscles, posterior ligaments, or from the disc, posterior longitudinal ligament, or the dura if someone came in with back pain. For example, someone came in with buttock or leg pain, it would then be from the nerve root. And if it were from the back going into the thigh or posterior lateral thigh, it could also be from the facet joints. We now look at um, a list of causes and we've classified them um, into mechanical, non-mechanical and visceral causes. Under the mechanical causes, you would find um, that you have lumbar causes, discogenic causes, spinal canal stenosis, and other causes such as congenital causes and acquired causes such as Pagets and Schurman's where you have deposition of calcium or, uh, and calcification of several different areas. Non-mechanical causes can be divided into neoplastic, inflammatory and infective. Bearing in mind tuberculosis can have a rare presentation um, in some patient groups and other causes such as large hemangiomas which can present with vertebral body pains, osteophytes being more common. Visceral causes um, very important to remember vascular causes and to give you an example we had a patient who, who had seen several pain uh, clinics presented with abdominal and groin related pain was treated for low back pain and when we saw her we sent her out for further investigations came back as being positive for 70 percent occlusion of the iliac artery now vascular presentation can be quite significant and can easily be mistaken for uh, low back pain arising from the posterior column. Uh, not to be ruled out, uh, not, not to be mistaken, is also aortic abdominal aneurysm as we discussed and that would be a category 3 red flag which needs serial follow-ups. Gastrointestinal causes, uh, pancreatitis and other causes along with it, pelvic causes and renal causes. So when we talk about clinical evaluation, uh, where do we go? Well, I think it's important that a history and examination will guide diagnosis, but it's important also to seek out other associated symptoms. So bearing in mind that we've discussed about uh, all the risk flags, uh, categorization of those risk flags, if they are present, any bowel or bladder symptoms, especially ruling out a cord equina, uh, weight loss, fevers, remember tuberculosis, uh, all of this needs to be uh, evaluated during a detailed history. And someone once said that it's uh, that out of a clinical consultation, uh, you know, out of 30 minutes when you evaluate a patient, 20 minutes would be dedicated to taking a detailed history, and the examination plays a less important role. So that's laying the impetus or the reiterating the importance of 
a detailed history. Always remember to consider the risk factors. When you look at patients who have a clinical presentation in the low back area, you could classify it on the basis of it arising at, a cert at the level of a certain disc, and you will find this table useful with all the detailed tests in relation to that. You could also classify it as a, uh, on the basis of the nerve root from which it arises and use it as a quick screening tool. This little table here gives you uh, the options of how you would go about doing that. If you go on to further evaluatory tests, the straight leg test is a common test that is used in the clinic. Um, however, the sensitivity of the test is variable, it's high. The specificity, however, remains debatable. Uh, a crossed straight leg test, on the other hand, is more specific, and contralateral signs are more specific, secondary to a cross leg test. If the pain is present on the ipsilateral side, it may signify a sequestered disc. Bear in mind also that a straight leg test, if positive and does not reproduce radiculopathy, might be a poor prognostic sign. What other tests could you use to support your diagnosis? Uh, you could evaluate the sacroiliac joint and other aspects of the posterior column. Um, and the common tests that are used to evaluate the sacroiliac joint is Faber's test, also known as um, Patrick's predominantly known as Patrick's test, but also known as Faber's test, which is flexion, abduction, and external rotation, Gensland's test, and Newman's test. Uh, all of these tests have been discussed uh, in detail under history and examination uh, by Dr. Crystallis. Bear in mind, provocation tests are non-specific, and they have insufficient evidence to, st to strongly support their use. So would leg pain always be from the nerve root. It's important to um, have some understanding of the other differential diagnosis and contributory factors, hip joint arthritis, trochanteric bursitis, sciatic nerve entrapment, and piriformis syndrome may contribute significantly to uh, these presentations. Uh, we just talked very briefly about piriformis syndrome, and the piriformis muscle has a variable presentation. In 11 to 13 percent of the patients, it may um, be enclosed within the two branches of the sciatic nerve and thereby contribute to a sciatica kind of presentation. It is important to rule this out as sometimes patients may benefit from just a release of the muscle or from injective interventional options. We now move on to investigations and um, we, we, are, we are going to discuss the investigations on the basis of this x-ray that we have put up. Um, if you look at this x-ray, it quite clearly uh, gives us a lot of information about the bony structure. It tells us about the alignment of the vertebral body, uh, the alignment of the last lumbar vertebra in relation to the sacrum, it gives you information about the neural foramina, and overall, there's a lot of bony structure-related information that we can get. So when you look at x-rays, they demonstrate vertebral alignment, neural foramina, vertebral body architecture, fractures, osteophytes, bone tumors, facet disruption, and infection. In this x-ray, we also notice disruption of the L5-S1 facetal architecture. They give, you, give us very little information about the soft tissue. However, this information can be deciphered looking at for example, in, on this x-ray, the neuroforamen um, architecture. They are equivocal in around 75% of the cases, and in the remaining 25%, there may be a possibility of high false positives. MRI scans, they're much better and provide you higher detail regarding soft tissue. So they would outline the disc, spinal cord, you can use it to rule out cord equina and nerve root pathology. Uh, just as Brief reminder that uh, the T1 image is the CSF is black and T2 is just white. CT scans, they're useful in detecting bony pathology, tumors, fractures, very good. And if you're trying to rule out um, neural compromise in any way, looking at the bony outline would give you that information. There are limitations with spinal canal stenosis, and especially because the soft tissue cannot be identified quite clearly from a CT scan. They're useful if an MRI is contraindicated. Um, CT myelograms, they're definitely useful when MRIs are contraindicated and, they f and following major spinal instrumentation. They're sensitive to rule out spinal nerve compression as well. Spec scans, uh, very useful tests, especially if you're trying to locate 
specific small lesions as they pick up on the inflammatory changes. They are inflammatory markers and the protocols have been used for several different uh, investigative strategies such as bone scans, myocardial perfusion scans, white cell scans, etc. Um, they are more specific, uh, like we said, and so pedicular lesions would suggest ca some cancerous origin. Facet joint lesions are generally benign and suggest some ongoing inflammatory change or arthritic presentation. Vertebral body or spinous process changes may be cancerous or benign. And it's very good at isolating a specific inflammatory lesion. We are going to talk about modic changes and uh, we will discuss these changes on the basis of MRI findings specifically. Type 1 changes show you a decreased intensity and an in on T1 and an increased intensity on T2. Uh, the main changes are secondary to marrow edema. Histologically, it shows some disruption and fissuring of the end plate. Type 2 changes they show an increased intensity signal on T1 and an iso-intense or a hypo-intense signal on T2. The main changes are in plate disruption and abundant fat deposition, uh, yellow marrow in this case. Bear in mind again, type 1 converts to type 2, but type 2 is stable. Type 3 shows decreased signal intensity on both T1 and T2 images and shows dense woven bone histologically with no marrow uh, to produce any MRI signal changes. Okay. We now move on to management of low back pain. And when we talk about management, it's important to understand that it is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we look at non-surgical strategies and surgical strategies. We also have a whole range of interventional options available to the, to the patient. Non-surgical strategies, uh, the aim would be to optimize analgesia, and I'm sure the pharmacological options will be discussed in detail. Um, there may be also uh, the option of adding in interventional therapies and a multidisciplinary approach at the same time, which would, the multidisciplinary approach could be obtained through physical therapies, psychological support, cognitive-based therapies, education, and other strategies such as TENS and acupuncture. As for any patient, it's important to understand that it has to be a multidisciplinary approach and it has to be personalized or individualized to help optimize their benefits from the program. Surgical options. These are meant to provide or address specific abnormalities. For example, if someone had a structural change such as scoliosis or kyphoscoliosis which needs surgical correction, spinal correction would help with that. If there is a grade three of grade four anterior or retholysis that would help the surgical correction of it would help stabilization. Nerve root compression uh, these could be addressed by foraminotomies or laminectomies. Decompressive surgery for large disc bulges such as uh, laminectomies or discectomies may be helpful as well. It, it can also be considered for failed conservative therapies and if you have an acute dense motor pathology. More recent therapies, including disc replacement um, treatments with implants, um, have been trialed. And future therapies include uh, stem cell related bio biological models to replace the intervertebral disc. When we talk about interventional procedures, there are several different procedures that we offer patients in a chronic pain setting. And they may include joint blocks, nerve or nerve root blocks, and ablative techniques joint blocks, in this case being facet joint or sacroiliac joint blocks, nerve root blocks, a whole range of them depending on the structures that need to be blocked. We could block either the medial branch as we discussed before uh, and you could block the plexuses such as the celiac or hypogastric plexus or lumbar sympathetic plexus depending on the origin of pain, the hypogastric plexus as well, dorsal root ganglion blocks and different approaches to the nerve root or to the epidural space. Ablative techniques are predominantly radioablative techniques. They can be either dry or cooled procedures. Um, and if you, if you, especially if you're using the uh, cool techniques, they're quite useful in the sacroiliac area where pain can be a significant problem. Thermal intradiscal procedures uh, and these procedures such as biaculoplasties or intervertebral idet, intervertebral discanuloplasties have a significant role in managing uh, low back pain, how the evidence on them is still limited. 
chemical denovation using phenol, um, cryonucleolysis or cryoablation are other techniques that can be used as well. When you consider low, mechanical low back pain, um, we think about all the potential options that are available to the patient, including pharmacological, functional restorative programs, cognitive behavioral uh, management strategies, in combination with pharmacological measures and basic interventional, minimally invasive interventional procedures. With uh, mechanical low back pain, uh, we do two, according to the ISIS guidelines, we would do two um, separate diagnostic medial branch blocks, and following those, if they are successful, go on to perform um, a radiofrequency ablation or denovation of the medial branches to help provide moderate term pain relief. Like I mentioned before, with the sacroiliac joint, you would choose to have the cooled radiofrequency procedure. Studies have proven that uh, patients have obtained over six months to a year of good pain relief following radiofrequency ablative procedures. Mechanical low back pain secondary to fractures may be addressed using vertebroplasties in the past and more recently balloon kyphoplasties, which seems to be a much safer technique and more effective. However, the evidence on it is still debatable. We spoke very briefly about piriformis syndrome and piriformis injections, including intramuscular injection of botulinum toxin uh, helps relieve symptoms in relation to myofascial presentation in those um, presenting with piriformis syndrome. We now move on to lumbar radicular pain and briefly we shall talk about epidural steroid injections which are commonly used in the pain clinic uh, to understand the evidence base behind it and the complications from epidurals. They are widely used. Um, the Cochrane reviews have supported it to a certain extent, however, there have been controversial uh, results in these studies. The NNT for short-term relief is um, 7.3 and for long-term up to around a year is 13. There is limited research and ongoing studies hopefully would provide further evidence on it. When we look at the complications from epidural steroid injections, um, bearing in mind where the particulate matter of the steroid component is injected, there can be vascular problems and paraplegia has been a rare, com rare complication from it, retinal complications as well. Dural puncture, infections at the in in injection site, corda equina, sensory motor deficits, discitis and epidural granuloma have also been noted. When we move on to further treatment options, uh, percutaneous discompression and nucleoplasties or coablation te coablative techniques have also been used to help manage uh, disc-related pain. Their role in management of axial pain or mechanical pain presentation is questionable. However, it is very, it, it, they are useful in management of um, pain arising from the disc. Electrical stimulatory techniques. Uh, TENS, uh, as proposed on the basis of the gate control theory, is a useful aspect in multimodal approach to pain management and should be included uh, in as part of our treatment. It may also sometimes be used as a trial to understand if patient likes the stimulatory pattern provided by TENS prior to embarking on either a peripheral electrical neuromodulatory strategy or dorsal column neuromodulatory strategy. When we talk about um, dorsal column neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulators are used and they are very useful in management of CRPS type of patients or fail back surgery patients, presenting with neuropathic leg pain and, and also uh, other neuropathic presentations. There's some discussion about its use in ischemic pain and refractory angina pain. Several studies have been carried out. However, it is still in the research stage to provide good evidence on its use in these groups of patients. When we talk about peripheral nerve stimulation, um, the, often we find that subcutaneous electrical stimulation or perineural implantation of electrodes provides stimulation and reduction of pain. Uh, we may, you may choose to use either the peripheral electrical nerve stimulation kits or per peripherally placed electrodes from several different companies which allow carrying out these procedures which help manage pain. Apart from the interventional procedures, there are cognitive behavioral 
um, strategies that may be introduced or used in conjunction um, with treatment, other treatment modalities to help patients manage their pain better. We find that ra randomized controlled trials on CBT approaches have been quite encouraging, suggesting uh, a prolonged benefit that patients may obtain from these techniques. Case reports have suggested supportive psychotherapy, group therapy and counselling may be useful for chronic pain management. Um, there may be several newer techniques available to manage patients um, you know, by providing them there may be several newer techniques that may, that are available to patients to uh, provide CBT, and uh, one of them would be a con community-based program, which would be a seamless integrated care program, which addresses several different aspects and provides patients with exactly what they would need, including uh, exercise-based strategies, cognitive restructuring and modeling, um, financial support, social support, all of it being brought into one. Internet-based techniques have been used more recently and um, the benefits from internet-based techniques have been that patients who are highly motivated, have access to a computer, can go through a CBT-based program. And the CBT-based programs are predominantly mindfulness-based programs or uh, acceptance and commitment therapies uh, programs which have uh, provided them good results in some centers. How do we evaluate the outcomes from a management strategies for low back pain? Well, if you look at this particular paper by Chapman and Norville, uh, pr which was published more recently in Spine, they, used, they looked at the more common uh, evaluatory tools and found the functional outcomes were measured with the Oswestry Disability Score, Ron Morris Score, and Range of Motion Tests. They found pain was evaluated by the Numerical Pain Rating Scale, Brief Pain Inventory, Pain Disability Index, Megal Pain Questionnaire, and Visual Analog Skills. When they looked at um, psycho psychological function, they found fear avoidance, beliefs questionnaires, temper scales, and Beck depression inventories were most commonly used. Quality of life was measured using the SF36, SF12, Nottingham Health Profile, and the Sickness Impact Profile test. They also looked at ob objective measures such as a return to work, work status, complications and adverse effects and medications that were used to evaluate outcomes. Some preference-based measures were used and these were the EQ5D and the SF60. The EQ5D, I'm going to spend a little time explaining the EQ5D. Now this is an interesting test that has been used to uh, complement qualies and qualies are um, tools which are used to measure the cost effectiveness of a therapy that is provided. Quality stands for quality adjusted life years and it is how much and how effective a treatment is and how much does the treatment cost to provide that benefit to a patient during their life years of that particular medical problem, in this case low back pain. The EQ5D is a test that has contributed signif significantly to the quality evaluation and has been very useful um, in this context. So to summarize, today we have discussed the risk factors for low back pain. We have looked at the risk flags. Um, we have spoken about biopsychosocial factors, personal factors. We've looked at the anatomical considerations and classification of pain into acute and chronic or subacute, acute, subacute and chronic. We have looked at the risk flags and categorized the red flags we have also looked at wardle signs and non-organic causes. We have looked at the sources of low back pain uh, and the structural contributions from each area. We have looked at the other causes of low back pain, bearing in mind that we need to rule out the other causes that may be contributory to low back pain. We have also looked at the management strategies, very briefly, ba based on an evidence-based um, approach. And it's important that we review all of these every time we see the patient, looking at them every single time to rule out any risk factors and review at each consultation as to what would be the best way to provide a personalized and structured treatment approach in a multidisciplinary manner to each patient. And that completes the talk on low back pain. Thank you.